The following content is provided by MIT OpenCourseWare under a Creative Commons license. Additional information about our license and MIT OpenCourseWare in general is available at ocw.mit.edu. Anyway, the, um, if, if you're sitting there saying, what are they talking about, weird thing in the syllabus, that suggests you didn't read the syllabus, which is why we put the weird line in the syllabus about, what is it, uh, what a warrior your mother would have been. That, that, that sounds faintly familiar? Well, it should sound familiar from reading the syllabus, right? Nobody's got a clue where it's from, right? Except for Rachel. I know Rachel knows because I told her today. Um, but, um, I, and, and obviously I cleverly arranged for it not to be something that could be Googled because several years ago when Google appeared, I had a line in there to make sure people were reading it and, you know, within 10 seconds of handing out the syllabus, half the class said, oh yeah, that's from like Richard III or something. So this, this one couldn't be Googled. Um, it is in fact from... Uh, 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 book by John Steinbeck. Um, you probably all read some Steinbeck in, in high school. Those of you who are fans of Arthurian literature might want to read his rewrites of, um, of the King Arthur or chunks of the King Arthur story. And when you do, you will discover that that line about thinking about a, what kind of a warrior your mother would have been is, is in there. Great book. Um, any other questions of similar moment that I should be answering at the present time? No, okay, well, what I'm going to talk about today is more of the detail, if you like, um, of the... Last, last time I had up on the board this business about you're a slave to the environment, you're a slave to your brain. Well, this is the details of the, uh, of the way in which you are a slave to your environment. Now, typically, that is... Uh, um, the heading of the, the, the title of the lecture is something like learning. The chapter is learning. Um, you're here thinking that what you came to do today is to learn, and that's not what we're talking about. The sort of learning that you are doing here is, um, this is material that really gets covered in memory. I, I present material to you. You store it. Um, in, in memory somewhere at the appropriate time you retrieve it from memory we'll talk about that in a few, uh, a few sessions down the line what I'm talking about today is a particular form of learning which you can think of as association learning um, a very reflexive uh, form of learning a form of learning that um, is phylogenetically very old uh, it shows up in all sorts of, uh, it, essentially in any beast you care to try it out in. Um, indeed, if you were to go to, uh, those of you who are budding neuroscience sorts, if you were to go to Eric Kandel's website um, and uh, look at his Nobel Prize uh, lecture, because he won the Nobel Prize, you don't usually post your Nobel Prize lecture until you win it because a little arrogant otherwise. Um, he won the Nobel Prize for working out the details of, of simple association learning um, in a beastie known as, and initially his work was done in a beastie known as a plesia or a plesia, which is a sea slug. It looks like a dill pickle and has just about as much personality and brain. Um, but it is capable of this form of, um, of learning. Gorgeous. I, 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 it's, it's, it's a gorgeous lecture. Nice, nice, uh, um, nice art on the website. And uh, um, it's, you know, if you're going to give a Nobel Prize lecture, you kind of don't want to waste it. So I heard him give a version of this at a different meeting in Australia, and it's 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 a it's a good lecture. Um, all right, what kind of learning is this um, that that we're talking about? H how many people here um, like strawberries? Some people like strawberries, some people don't like strawberries. Now, you did not come into the world knowing that fact. You now know that fact. And I do not think that most of you learned that fact 
you know, like in circle time at preschool. Hello, children. Today we're going dis- to decide if you like strawberries. You like strawberries. You don't like strawberries. They make you, you know, break out in a rash. There's no, right? You learned about your taste for strawberries in some different way. You learned that you should, uh, you know, dive under the bed when you see a flash of lightning because you're scared of the thunder. You learned about that not because you went to thunder school, but because you learned about the association. Um, you picked it up from the... You picked it up from the environment. Um, and that's what... Uh, it's that sort of association learning that I'm going to um, talk about Today I'm going to talk about two different versions. One of them is learning associations between stimuli in the world, um, traditionally known as classical conditioning or Pavlovian conditioning in honor of Ivan Pavlov. The other is the learning the associations between what you do and the consequences of what you do, often called operant conditioning, sometimes called Skinnerian conditioning in honor of B.F. Skinner, um, one of its great uh, practitioners. Now, let's, let's start with this stimulus, stimulus uh, form of learning. Um, the, uh, um, the basic classical conditioning experiment is one of those experiments that people know about before they come into uh, a psych class, typically. That's Pavlov and his salivating dogs. What Pavlov was doing... Um, was studying digestion in, uh, and dogs were his animal of choice. In fact, he's also a Nobel Prize winner, but his Nobel Prize uh, lecture, well, it probably is posted on the web somewhere. But anyway, he won the Nobel Prize for working out the digestive, um, work on the digestive enzymes in, uh, I think, the stomach. Um, He then decided he was interested in digestive enzymes in saliva, and he needed a supply of saliva. Where are you going to get saliva from? Well, what he did was um, he put a little cannula, a little hole in the cheek of a dog um, and a little collection tube. And then he took his dog, put him in a sort of a harness and sprayed powdered meat into the dog's mouth. If you spray powdered meat into a dog's mouth, the dog does what? The dog salivates. And since the dog's got a little hole in here, some of the saliva drools out, and, and, and you can go off and study it. What Pavlov discovered that was of interest to him, well, it turned out to be of interest to him, was that he'd you know, get up in the morning, grab the dog, put the dog in the harness, and the dog would start salivating before any meat powder showed up. Pavlov's thinking, hmm, I can save on meat powder. The, but well, that, the reason, the difference between the rest of us schlumps and Nobel Prize winning guys is when they see something interesting, they know that it's interesting. And what Pavlov figured out is the dog is anticipating the meat powder. The dog has learned that this situation means meat powder in some fashion. Gee, that's actually more interesting, said Pavlov, than dog drool. I'm going to study that for a while. Um, and so what he did was he set up the, the more familiar form of this, where, let's introduce some terminology, he had food, the meat powder, we will call that an unconditioned stimulus. The characteristic of an unconditioned stimulus is that it produces an unconditioned, whoops, an unconditioned response, saliva in this case, without you having to do anything. Yeah, get your off-the-shelf dog, that dog's going to drool for you if you give it food. Um, Then what he did was to pair that unconditioned stimulus with a conditioned stimulus, like a bell or a tone or something like that. So... Now he was going, bell, food, and the dog obligingly drooled. Bell, food, drool. Boom, boom, boom. Over and over again. Then the critical thing to do is you turn, uh, you, you, you do just the bell by itself and skip the food. What do you discover? You discover that the bell by itself now produces the saliva. And when the bell, the, when the conditioned stimulus alone is producing the response, we call that the conditioned response. The animal has learned an association between bell and food, and you're seeing that learning by measuring this, um, uh, this, this conditioned response. Um, that kind of learning, which is what, what Kandel was studying in aplesia, 
is presumably reflexive, automatic, outside of the realm of consciousness, even if I fall into sort of sloppy kind of language later, understand that the dog is not presumed to be sitting there thinking, hmm, bell, what, what does that bell mean? That bell symbolizes for me the appearance of... No, 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 no. Reflexive. Happening automatically. Doesn't matter what, uh, the, you know, what the dog does or does not think. Indeed, you can fall victim to this sort of thing um, quite apart from your conscious wishes, desires, whatever. There's a, uh, a, a vision researcher, um, sort of a half a generation older than me, who's still mad at me because 30 years ago I couldn't escape being uh, conditioned in this fashion. Back in those days, the apparatus, when you were putting up a visual stimulus, made a noise. I was supposed to push one button as quickly as I could. One button if I saw something and another button if I didn't see something. But every time he put up a stimulus, the apparatus went click. And I just would hit the stupid button. Um, I, I had learned the association between click and, and, um, and the stimulus and, and uh, you know, my, my little sea slug brain was refusing to be overridden by this you know, great big conscious apparatus of this guy wants me to look for some really boring thing that I, and he's still mad at me. It's very, very sad. Um, okay, this is... Um, this is a very rule-governed behavior. In fact, it probably says that on the handout. No, it says what's being learned here. Um, it's, uh, it's a very rule-governed um, behavior. Pavlov himself worked out many of the rules, and then a, a large body of research afterwards continued um, that effort. And let me tell you about some of the constraints on this form of learning and then explain a bit about how it is that this might actually have anything to do with learning more interesting uh, things than well, what the sea slug learns is um, that, gee, when, the, uh, uh, when, when I sense shrimp juice, as I recall, in the water, that means somebody's going to poke me. You know, so I should retract my gill. That's the, 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 the response that the, the, the sea slug makes is to retract its gill. The response the dog makes is to drool. I mean, that's nice, but it's not... How does that relate to anything like human behavior? Um, so let me tell you a few of the constraints on it. Uh, first, a, a, a constraint that's really more like an advertisement for next time is to say that we talk about these... Uh, can, uh, conditioned stimuli out there, in this case the, uh, the bell, it, even something like deciding what the stimulus is, is not an entirely trivial business. So suppose I was to come in here with, uh, well, with, 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 with uh, a rabbit, let's say. Come here and with a rabbit. Every time I walk in with the rabbit, I uh, activate the uh, electric grid that's in your seat, you know, and, and you all get a little zits, and um, you, know, you jump in the air. Eventually, um, I bring the rabbit in, and what happens? You jump without me having to bother running electric current through your, through your posterior. What's the stimulus there? Well, we sort of naturally would say, it's, you know, it, it's the rabbit. Um, and it could be the rabbit's ear. It could be rabbit ear uh, combined with blackboard or something like that. It turns out that we have natural, and animals have natural ways of carving up the world into stimuli, into objects perhaps. Um, and even answering, when, when you're trying to figure out what's governing the behavior of an animal, it's not even immediately trivially obvious um, what that stimulus might be. That's what we'll end up talking about for the next few lectures after this. But sticking with the realm of, um, uh, of the constraints on the learning uh, itself, um, one important constraint is that you have to notice the relationship between the um, conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus. One version of that is completely trivial. If I use a very quiet bell that you can't hear, you don't learn anything about it. You know, big deal. The more interesting case 
um, is, uh, uh, is illustrated by a phenomenon known as overshadowing. Suppose what I do is um, I, I, I produce, I, I have two stimuli that appear at the same time. Uh, this, this bell and, and a, a, a little light. You know, a nice little you know, little LED or something like that. So, um, bell and light followed by food. Bell and light followed by food. Bell and light followed... There's a loud bell. And a little light. Got it? Okay, what happens in this situation is that when you play the bell by itself, you get salivation. When you play the light by itself, even though the light was always followed by the food, you don't get salivation. Because the light has been overshadowed. That's where the, the, where the jargon comes from. The light's been overshadowed by the presence of the bell. What's the critical control experiment in, in an overshadowing paradigm? What do you need to know here for this to be interesting? Yeah? You have to do a training session with some other dog or rat or something with just the light. You have to go light food, light food, light food and show that this relatively wimpy light, if presented in isolation will produce perfectly fine learning. And that, you know, in the interesting version of the experiment, that's in fact the case. But when you present, um, you know, bell and light together, the stronger bell captures the learning and the weaker light loses. So, you know, and this is a silly example where I was bringing in a rabbit. You know, if, if the rabbit uh, was, uh, oh, I don't know, wearing a little silver ring or something like that, you'd learn the association between rabbit and shock, but not the association between ring and shock, perhaps, because it was too small, too, uh, it, it was a, overshadowed as a stimulus. Um, it is also critical that the um, CS predicts the U.S. Did I get that right? Yes, the, the, un, the conditioned stimulus has to predict the unconditioned stimulus. It is not adequate simply for the uh, CS to just show up every time the U.S. shows up. So, as a, um, as a silly example, um, everybody who uh, bombs the midterm in this ca- class, uh, almost everybody, maybe it's not perfect, but it's a pretty good association, almost everybody who bombs the midterm in this class drank something shortly before <laughs> doing that. Right? So, drink, bomb. And it works every year, so there's lots of pairings. Drink, bomb, drink. Look, I wouldn't, on the basis of that, give up drinking. Uh, there's, there's, no, there's no predictive value there because you drink a bunch of times when nothing has anything to do with the midterm you, uh, there's no relationship what's important is a contingent predictive relationship this is a brain mechanism that's there to learn what in the world predicts what other thing in the world in the standard Pavlovian setup here the prediction is perfect every time you ring the bell um, you get the food if you cut that down so that the prediction is imperfect, it's sort of correlational, you'll still learn, but you'll learn less. And you'll learn more slowly. So if, um, you know, if, if half the time the bell rang, you got food, and the bell never rang any other time, the animal would learn that bell more or less means food. But it would be slower and, 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 and less... Um, uh, and, and less strong. That's not what I wanted to move. You know, I've been speaking of learning. I've been teaching in this room for years, and I've still never managed to reliably use these boards. Always push the wrong button. All right. So suppose if you've got a if you've got a good strong, you know, bell food, bell food, bell food kind of thing. What you're going to do is over time you build up um, a rate of responding to some sort of asymptotic level, um, what happens if you change the contingency? Most particularly, what happens if you stop feeding the, the dog after the bell? Hmm? Oh, the response will go away, not the dog. The dog doesn't have the option in this particular case. Yeah, the, 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 uh, the response will go away. Um, that's known in the conditioning literature as extinction. Um, the response will extinguish. 
the interesting question, I mean, that, that makes sense, right? You know, if, 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 if the contingency no longer applies, why should I continue to respond on the basis of a contingency that's no longer valid? Did you forget, um, you the dog, did you forget that contingency or unlearn that contingency? Is it gone? The answer is no. It still seems to be there in some sense. Um, it's just, it, it's just you're no longer making the response. How do we know that? Well, for instance, if you were to give the dog a little break, send him home, then put him back in the apparatus, you would discover that the response, even if you never uh, presented any more food, the response would come back and then extinguish again. This is known as spontaneous recovery. And, you know, to use the language that we shouldn't be using, it's like the dog saying, all right, you know, all right, Bell predicts food. Oh, Bell doesn't predict food anymore. I mean, it's not like I forgot that the Bell used to predict the food. I'm not a dumb dog. I remember that, but it doesn't anymore, so why should I drool? Okay, now, I wonder what situation we're in here. Is it, are we back here or are we here? Well, we'll drool a little bit just to see. The... Uh, you know, again, the dog is not presumed to be doing anything like that kind of thinking. Um, but it's not that far off from, from more complicated uh, situations that you could imagine in, in, um, in the real world. So, um, you, uh, uh, you develop a relationship with another person that produces some rate of, of, uh, of, of conditioned response or something like that. Because, uh, you know, uh, you know you're, well, you're responding in any case. Then she, he decides not to have anything further to do with you. The response disappears. Then comes, oh, I don't know, summer vacation. And you see her again after vacation. Do you emit a response? Well, well, well are we here? Or maybe we're back here. You know, so you know, maybe a little response, and then so it, it's that's 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 spontaneous that's spontaneous recovery. Um, I mentioned last time that you are better set up to. Uh, the original notion was sort of that you were a general purpose association learner; you could learn anything. The the evidence from preparedness, which I talked about before, suggests that you are better prepared to learn some things than others. So you're better prepared to learn that snakes are scary than that bunnies are scary, for instance. So it's not it's it's fairly general purpose, or at least there are aspects of association learning that seem to be general purpose, but not all of it is is completely um, general purpose. Um, one constraint. The one thing that you are certainly set up to do is to notice um, associations only over a limited time window. So um, here, oh, I lost it underneath there, right? Tone followed by food. Tone followed by food. That's the CS followed by um, the US, right? So let's take this asymptotic point here and plot that. Over here. Now suppose that we systematically vary the relationship in time between the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus. Well, this is on the, uh, this is on the order, say, of one or two seconds. If I feed, uh, if I ring the bell today and feed you tomorrow, how much learning do you figure we get? Not a lot. First of all, it's a very long, boring experiment. Um, since we need lots of pairings. But basically, um, you, don't, you don't have to go that far, but it's going to fade off in this direction. That it, you can't have too long a period between the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus. Um, zero doesn't produce much uh, conditioning and negative relationships. So I give you food and then I ring a bell that says, you know, food... That was food, food, that was food. You know, okay. Little, there, 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 it, it doesn't hit zero at zero, but, but there's really basically very little happening down that way. So there's a narrow time window within which this chunk of you is looking for associations um, out there in, in, in the world. Uh, the, the, the real world example here might be bump signs on the highway. 
When is a bump sign on the highway useful? If the bump sign shows up at exactly the same place as the bump, thank you, you want it to show up a little bit before the bump. It shows up after the bump, you know, that was a bump. <laughs> That's not that useful. Um, so cons- it's, it's limited, constrained in, um, um, in time. Now... How can we go and get from this nice rule-governed behavior to um, more complicated behaviors? One route to that is, um, or one, one way to see how that might work is, is, a, is a paradigm in the conditioning literature known as uh, sensory... Did it again, didn't I? Look at that. Got it, got it wrong on both dimensions. It's called sensory preconditioning. And do I, I'll just restart this over here. It's easier. Um, here's how a sensory preconditioning experiment might, might work if you were a rat or a dog or something like that. So step one, I'm going to show you a light and then I'm going to ring a tone. I'm going to do that a bunch of times. Light, tone, light, tone, light, tone. Then I'm going to play the light alone. Um, or I play the tone alone. Do you salivate? No, why should you salivate? It's got nothing to do with salivation. Step two. Tone food. That's just the classic, uh, the classic, classical conditioning paradigm. Tone food, tone food, tone food. Play the tone alone. Well, tone food, whoops. Saliva. So now I'm going to play the tone alone, and lo and behold, we know I'll get uh, the the conditioned response of salivation here. The critical test is now I play, I show the light in isolation. What happens? Well, what happens is that you get the conditioned response. The animal will now. Um, uh, will we'll now salivate in response to the um, uh, to the light alone. Why is this interesting? Well, what's the animal doing? Well, again, we can sort of think in in sort of conscious terms that aren't appropriate. The animal is saying, "Light. I know about light. Light means tone." Aha, tone, I know about tone. Tone means food. Um, So if tone means food, I should be like salivating. And if light means tone, I should be salivating there. So I think I'll just start, you know, drooling all over the place now. Um, What's important about this is you can see, actually you can see sort of graphically here, I'm managing to get more remote from the response. I'm working my way, way backwards. Suppose it was the case that at the end of every one of my lectures, around 323, I was to say, in summary, um, and that your habit was to immediately run out of class thereafter and get yourself a snack, you might discover that, as I said, in summary, um, that somebody walked in. Um, (laughs) you, You might discover that, as I said, in summary, that you started to feel hungry. Um, because, uh, because of an, a, a learned association. It might never occur to you until you examine this, why you feel hungry when I, when I said in summary. But um, if we look at this timing thing, it's not the case that I say in summary, and one second later I blow M&Ms into your mouth or something like that. <laughs> You've got to somehow explain how you work backwards from the, 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 you know, the eventual M&Ms here back to something that I said. And this is one way to do it. You imagine that what you've got is a, an automatic association learner. That's, its job is to look for um, sort of if A, then B situations in the world. And that it is capable of chaining those together. That you can go if A, then B... Um, if B, then C, if C, then A, and, you know, oh, hey, look, if this, then this thing way down the line somewhere. And if you can start chaining these simple associations together, all of a sudden you've got the possibility of having a much more complicated kind of um, uh, a, a tool that could potentially explain much more complicated kinds of behavior. Um, now this is, so that's classical conditioning. 
good for explaining or good for talking about um, relationships between stimuli out in the world. Um, the other thing, another thing that you would want to learn about is the relationship between what you do and its consequences. That's what we talked about a bit last time when I did that puzzle box, uh, the, the, the Thorndike puzzle box example. Um, you know, Thorn, uh, Thorndike's cat wasn't learning about, um, uh, was, was not so interested in learning about relations of stimuli in the world. What it was interested in learning is, if I do this, then I get that fish. Um, and that's the core of, of, um, of operant um, conditioning. Now, um, if this was... Well, I, I, I took this course once upon a time, um, but I took it at Princeton, where I was an undergrad. And um, the, uh, this, that allows me to encapsulate the basic difference between a Princeton undergraduate education... Oh, look at that. There's a guy wearing a Princeton sweatshirt right now that's don't don't cover it up you just you know unless she's no longer talking to you that's 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 the extinction curve over there um, anyway the uh, where were we oh yes the difference between a, 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 a Princeton education and MIT education is that at Princeton this course satisfied the science requirement um, you laugh um, but if I was to give this lecture at Princeton and say, at MIT, this course satisfies a sort of a, you know, humanities literature kind of requirement, they'd all laugh. So the main difference between the courses um, was not in what the, the, you know, the, the guy standing up front did in the way of lecturing, but here, of course, to satisfy the, to, to make it a Haas course, you do a lot of writing. And at, at, at Princeton, um, uh, we had, it was a lab course. Um, and it's a great pity in some way, I mean, it's excellent that you are off writing, but it's a great pity not to have a lab component to this because um, this operant conditioning thing is a lot cooler if you got a pigeon of your own. Which is, which is what we had. So the, if, if people, you don't, you don't end up with a, a salivating dog of your own, um, but, but pigeons, pigeons are okay. Um, so the, the, the classic, um, the version of, a, of, of, a, uh, of, of an operant conditioning experiment that people tend to know something about before they come into a course is, is a so-called Skinner box, which is uh, a, you know, a, a, a pigeon... Um, or, uh, well, <laughs> he can be a rat, too, if you want. Um, it, it's, uh, um, it's just a matter of where you put the whiskers. Um, anyway, so you, you, the idea of a Skinner box was you, you'd have an, an environment that could really control the, the options available to the pigeon or the rat. And, and what you'd have in a, in a pigeon Skinner box is a, um, uh, a, a box that had nothing much in it except for a key here that, that is hooked up to a little micro switch or something and that the animal could peck at and we could record the pecks um, and, and a little bin down here where the bird seed could show up. And you stick a pigeon in there and this is a hungry pigeon because you haven't fed it. Um, and so, yeah, this, you know, bummed out pigeon. Um, but if he pecks there... The, in, in the right ways, we, we'll, um, we'll feed him. Um, so, this is, a, this is simply the, the somewhat higher tech version of, of Thorndike's puzzle box, you'll recognize. The, the pigeon has to figure out um, to peck at the key. If you just stick a pigeon in a Skinner box, even a hungry pigeon, the pigeon just sits there. I mean, you know, does stuff. But the pigeon doesn't immediately say, hey, I take an intro psych, I know about this, I'm going to go and peck that thing. Um, you have to do what's known as shaping its uh, behavior. The first thing you have to do that's important is you have to get your pigeon from the basement to the fourth floor where the lab was. Um, and should you ever need to do that, the important thing to know is that, that plastic juice containers are really good. You take the pigeon, you stick him head first in the plastic juice container. Um, not with the juice in it. Uh, and, and then the, uh, the, the, the pigeon is actually quite calm under those circumstances. If you decide, 
how tough can a pigeon be and you don't need to do that because you can't find your juice container anyway. You just grab your pigeon because you're bigger than the pigeon and try to carry it upstairs. What you end up with with loose pigeons on like the second and third floor. Um, so uh, things that you're going to miss out on just because you're writing papers instead. What you do, once you stick that pigeon in the, pigeon, in, in the Skinner box, if you just sit there, it's going to be a long day. What you have to do is shape the pigeon's behavior. It probably says shaping somewhere on the handout. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Use the law of effect to shape the, uh, the animal, it says there. That doesn't mean like... <laughs> what it means is that... Um, uh, the pigeons are sitting there moving around doing pigeony like things, <laughs> feeling hungry, and the pigeon turns towards the wall that's got the key on, and you push a little button that gives him a little bird seed. He goes and eats the bird seed and goes back to doing pigeony things, but now the law of effects working. That that bird seed is a positive reinforcer, right? So the chunk of the bird's brain that is doing this association learning between action and its consequences saying bird seed, that was good bird seed, I like the bird seed, what do I do to get more bird seed? Um, well it's not saying that explicitly but it's saying we'll do whatever we were just doing. Okay? Well now you don't want him to just be looking at the wall so now after a couple of rounds of that you say okay bird you only get the bird seed if you move a little closer to the wall. The bird moves closer to the wall, and you know, all right, all right. Now you only get it if you're looking at the key. Now you're only getting it if you're right up there, and eventually you get the bird pecking at the um, uh, at the key, and then you can go off and do other cool experiments um, from there. But you have to you have to shape the behavior in the way you want, and and and, and the key business. I mean, this is the, there's a key, there's the bird food. That's that's somewhat arbitrary. Um, it's just you know, what Skinner wanted to use to control the birds, you know, to be, make it possible to measure the bird's behavior. Um, we had a very clever pigeon when I did this lab. And we got through the stuff that was in the lab book like really quickly. Probably because the pigeon had been the pigeon for a half a dozen other... You know. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, I'm supposed to fake it here and claim I don't know what's going on here. All right, yeah, yeah. Oh, good, we're shaped now. Give me the food. Um, but anyway, we decided that this pigeon... We, we, we still had some time. We thought, well, we'll, 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 we'll mess with this pigeon. Um, and so we started reinforcing the pigeon for turns. So, you know, no, no bird seed unless you make a quarter turn. Okay, no quarter... Unless you make a half turn. We eventually had the bird making three full turns for each and then sort of staggering over to the <laughs> bird seat. But we, we had this great ballet dancing pigeon. Um, and that's in fact the basis of um, trained animal acts that you may have seen at various places. And I should advertise that it's not confined to, uh, to, to, to pigeons and things like that. You can perfectly well condition um, human beings. I already, I think I used in the last uh, lecture the example of, of jokes as a case of behavior getting shaped. Jokes that get rewarded with laughs are, are get, get repeated. Jokes that get rewarded with smacks don't get repeated. Um, but uh, again, going back to my intro psych class, I should tell you that it is possible to condition the professor. Um, what you need to do is figure out, well, what reinforces uh, professors? The answer, uh, at least in this sort of a setting, is students who look kind of interested and, and smile and write notes. Um, at least that's what my professor, who was in fact a, an important learning theorist in his own right, that's what he told us. He said, if you look, you know, it, it's, it's reinforcing if you're, if you're looking like you're interested and you're writing notes. Um, and so you should, he told us, be able to pick a behavior that the professor is doing and reinforce it... Um, by smiling and writing notes at the appropriate time. So, you know, I was going to be a psych major. I did what I was told. I was sitting about there. Um, my friend and I, every time, the next, the next psych lecture, every time um, the professor came in, moved to the left, um, we smiled and took notes. <laughs> and by the end of lecture... <laughs> He was most of the way out the door. <laughs> it was great. Now, as evidence for the notion that this is quite unconscious and reflexive kind of learning, we told him about it afterwards. 
and he absolutely believed that it was possible that it had happened and absolutely reported no awareness that it had happened. Um, so you're welcome to try this. Um, you're even welcome to try it here. Let me tell you that I have made this offer in years past. Um, the, uh, and no, no, nobody has reported a great success, but the, the, the great failure was when one recitation section got together and decided there's strength in numbers. But it turns out that if everybody in a recitation sits, I still remember, they were all sitting there. If you all sit in one place, and I don't remember what I was supposed to do, but when I did it, they all went... <laughs> I kind of cracked up, but I don't believe I learned anything particular. Um, but but, uh, but it, it can sit out there as a challenge for you. If anybody gets it to work on, you know, the math guy or something. Is Arthur Maddox still teaching? 18 whatever? 18 in the spring. Oh, that's too long to wait. I've never been sure Maddox would notice anyway, but uh, they, that's a separate issue. Um, anyway, if anybody succeeds in, in conditioning their, their professor, do, do let me know. Um, the, uh, the point here is that this is a form of learning that does apply in, 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 the, uh, um, in the human world as well as in the... Um, as well as in the pigeon world. Once you've got that animal shaped to do what you want, you can then start studying um, the rules that govern that behavior. Let me say a word about schedules of reinforcement since I see that it's there on the hand. Actually, it doesn't say schedules. Of, oh, it does. Fixed and variable ratio and fixed and variable interval schedules of reinforcement. What that means is if you're reinforcing the pigeon every time he pecks, He's on a fixed ratio one schedule. Um, you shape up the behavior, and at some point the pigeon is trained. And if you're reinforcing him every time you, he makes a peck, he will emit pecks. So let's call this the peck rate. Um, he'll emit pecks at some asymptotic rate, not unlike the salivation thing over there. Actually, I want to save myself a little space here, so let's only go this far. So, an asymptotic rate of responding. Now, suppose that you change the rule. Suppose you say, you don't tell, you can, well, you can say it to the pigeon because the pigeon won't understand. You say to the pigeon, okay, now you get reinforced only every tenth peck. What's the pigeon going to do, do you think? What's that, what, what, what's the, how, how's, the cha- how's the behavior going to change? It's going to go squiggly, apparently. What, what is this? No, every, every tenth peck, not every ten seconds. You're, 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 I, I, I'm interpreting your squiggle as the answer to, the, to, to a later question, so save the squiggle. Um, it'll, it'll be good. Peck faster. That's a, whoever said that is it? That, that, that sounds... Re- well, if you've got to work harder to get the same reward, you're going you're gonna to end up um, pecking faster. Right? So I mean, th- th- you th- sort of think about it in terms of um, your... You know, once upon a time, you could get an A in, uh, in whatever, you know, writing, for writing like what my eight-year-old wrote this morning. Seven sentences of at least six words each. Took him, took him all of breakfast to do that because he'd lost his book. And anyway, it's a long story. But, you know, so he emitted um, his uh, writing behavior at a relatively low rate. Um, if you emit your writing behavior at that rate, you guys are going to be in serious trouble, right? To get the same reward, you now have to produce more work, and as a result, you'll crank up the level. So that would be a fixed ratio. What I was describing is every 10 pecks, that would be a fixed ratio of 10. A variable ratio is, um, is on average, every 10 pecks, you get reinforced. Um, and that actually produces even higher levels of... Um, Responding Now, what, what the squiggle was the answer to is what happens if instead of a ratio schedule, you have an interval schedule. Suppose you reinforce 
um, the behavior only for the first peck after every minute. Make a different graph over here. So, um, bird can peck it all they want, but only when they peck after this interval marker goes by are they going to get reinforced. Well, uh, I mean, a pigeon with a wristwatch is going to look at his watch and say, mm, pigeon doesn't have a wristwatch, of course, um, but they do have an ability to estimate time. And so what they do, you know, immediately after getting rewarded, they just sort of sit there. So this is, again, going to be rate of response. They just sit there, and then they say, it's like a minute gone yet. Oh, little... No, nothing happened. Uh, it's got it. Got it. Got to be. Got to be now. No, no, still not. Yes, got it. Uh, and then they. And, oh, it's got to be. No, 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 no. Boom. <laughs> and you get this very scallopy behavior. And now, if you don't think that has anything to do with human behavior, um, well, first of all, you can ask yourself about your writing output. Um, so, for instance, there's a paper due on a sort of a regular interval. <laughs> a smart pigeon would be emitting words at about that rate, right? I don't, well, actually, I did meet a student who claimed he was doing that. More power to him. Um, but I think most of you, you know, this is when it's due Friday. I think this, this point here is, is, is like uh, um, Friday 4 p.m. or something. Or, anyway, so you, p- people do, or, or you come to my house where um, if you're an eight-year-old, you get your allowance on the weekend, right? But only if you do your chores. So Monday, is my kid asking what chores he should do? No. Saturday morning? You bet. What can I do? What can I do? You know, make my, I made my bed. Can I lick the floor now? You know. <laughs> um, so it, 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 these sorts of things. Oh, and, and the downside of this is um, one of the reasons for paying people on a Friday is that if you pay them on a Thursday, they don't show up on Friday. They get, I mean, you know, even, even though at some level they, they're, they're much more likely to be sick on the Friday if you, if, you, if you pay them on the Thursday so you want to pay them on a Friday and then they can be sick all weekend on their own time um, so um, that's, that's what we mean by, by schedules of reinforcement this is also operant conditioning is also a very rule governed behavior it is governed by rules that are in many ways similar to the rules for classical conditioning so unsurprisingly um, let's just do this one as an example it's probably later on in the handout um, so I, uh, I, I reward little old pigeon every time he pecks the key now I stop rewarding him what happens to the behavior Boom. Yeah, that is. I take that boom to mean, yeah, it extinguishes. Um, if I give him a break, I'll get some spontaneous recovery and it'll extinguish again, just like you'll get in classical conditioning. Um, what happens in these? How does, uh, how does the extinction compare in, in, in a schedule like this to a schedule like this? How about a hand? I'm hearing good mutterings, but nobody has a hand. Yeah, I know. I, well, all right. So, slower. I heard some more slower mutterings. It's slower. Um, if, you, if that's not intuitively obvious, ask yourself about the difference between um, a slot machine and uh, a Coke machine. Right? You put a buck in the Coke machine, you get a Coke. Right? You put a buck in the Coke machine, you don't get a Coke. How many more bucks do you put in? <laughs> Well, all right, so you're not too dumb. That's good. Okay, now you go to Las Vegas. You put a buck in the slot machine and, and you don't get anything out. What do you do? Put another buck in. Actually, Las Vegas is a beautiful example of, of applied um, conditioning theory. It's, it's just, you, you could, you, uh, we could send everybody on a class trip. That, actually, we did that, didn't we, sort of? There's that MIT, there's that bestseller about the, that, that was more applied math than applied psychology. The applied psychology thing is, um, when a slot machine pays off, 
Traditionally, what happens is the coins come out, right? Not now, often they're electronic, but they simulate it anyway. Um, the coins come out. Um, what do the coins hit when they come out? Metal. metal. Why do they hit metal? To make, to make a racket. Why do you want to make a racket? Well, that racket itself becomes positively reinforcing. You want to hear that sound, right? You want to put that buck in and hear, oh yeah, this is very good stuff. Now, slot machines. When you, I mean, you don't go off and play slot machines a lot, but you see the movies, um, I hope. If you, anyway, slot machines are uh, typically located in small soundproof booths. No, where are they located? On a giant floor with thousands of slot machines. What does that mean? That means when somebody five blocks over gets a payoff, what do you hear? You hear the sound. Well, that sound is what you're conditioned to, to, that you've been conditioned to find that reinforcing. And you are so dumb. They know that you are gonna, you're willing to be reinforced by somebody else getting paid off. And you say, oh, oh man, there's money happening here. Let me put some more into this thing. Um, anyway, lovely applied, psycho- lovely applied psychology in, in you know, the worst sense of the word. Um, well, maybe not the worst. I can think of a few others. But while I'm thinking of a few other worse ones, t- uh, take a minute to, uh, to stretch. Reinforce your neighbor. Wake up your neighbor if that's necessary. <laughs> association learner and have you know your, your mechanisms in your brain that are basically saying um, you know teach me about the associations between stimuli or the associations between my acts and their consequences um, and, and I can be fairly uh, broad minded about what those stimuli are or what those acts might be and then there are special purpose versions of these things designed for very particular tasks um, and to uh, l- l- let me let me fish around for what's perhaps the best example of this. Is there anybody here who knows the, uh, who, who can think of in in their life a food that they used to love, um, but they now hate or won't touch, and they know exactly why? Yeah, out there in the cheap seats. Um, I ate a chocolate. Perfect. Gee, first try. No weird examples this year. Um, now, you got the flu. Let, let's, let's get a little graphic here. You got the flu, and what happened? Thank you. That's what we needed to know. Um, and not only that, we also need to know, um, do you believe that the chocolate cupcake gave you the flu? Not anymore, but you definitely think that. <laughs> um, yeah. All right, uh, when I oh, he doesn't care that I already have a good example. He wants to give me another cool example. All right, all right. It's just another one. All right, all right. It's not as good. It's not as good? When I was in kindergarten, uh, first day of school, or the first week I ate lunch in the cafeteria, right, uh, public school, and I got dreadfully sick, and I didn't eat 
a school lunch again for five, six years. This is why why he's slim to this day. They, uh, <laughs> yeah, there. Um, this we'll, we'll, we'll actually we'll come back to to, uh, to that example. It serves useful a, a, a useful function um, a useful function too. Um, now the important pieces of this. So so she ate the cupcake. She got sick. She knows at some level it wasn't the cupcake that made her sick. But there is a chunk of brain that says. I got sick. I, I ate, ate cupcake shortly thereafter. Got sick. Um, don't want to eat cupcake anymore. This is a chunk of your brain that is quite immune, or, or it's actually very hard for you to talk to and say, wait a second, we used to love cupcakes. Cupcakes are really good. It doesn't want to hear about this. It says, you ate it, you got sick. And this is a form of association learning. It's got some... In, well, the original version of this was discovered... Um, in, well, the original version was discovered by some rat who ate a cupcake and threw up. But the, uh, in, in, the, in the learning literature, it was um, studied by a guy named Garcia, so it sometimes goes by the name of the Garcia effect. What he did was he had rats um, in, a, in a sort of a Skinner box situation. They had, uh, a, a, and he gave them a new flavor of water, like spearmint or something. And then he made the poor rat sick strapped it to uh, the turntable of a, of a record player. <laughs> An experiment you can't do anymore because you can't fit the rat into the CD drive. <laughs> the, um, but, um, the, uh, and, and then the next day, you give the rat a choice. You want spearmint water or you want this other new weird flavor. And the rat goes for the other flavor. Says, forget it, you know, I'm not going for the spearmint water. Um, but this is a very specific form of learning. It's sometimes called taste aversion, which is not quite right um, if you happen to be a sensation and perception person. Taste, as the sensation that your tongue does for you, is really restricted to sweet, sour, salty, and bitter. Um, what you become averse to um, is the flavor, most of which is smell, or perhaps, in human cases, a larger context like school lunch or something like that. But um, there are strong restrictions on what it is that, that, that you will uh, develop an aversion to, particularly if you're a rat. Um, so the other version, the experiment that Garcia did, was he gave rats um, a new bottle of water, and this one was flashing lights, right? Water never did that before. Drink the water. Get sick. Next day, you got a choice between the flashing light one and the one that's making clicking noises or something like that. Rat doesn't care. This little chunk of brain was not built to figure out that flashing water is a problem. This is a, this is a chunk of brain that is there to tell you that there are things, that, you know, that, we know, that it knows some things about food. Foods have flavors. And if, the, if you get sick some chunk of time after eating... Um, you should avoid that flavor the next time and things associated with that flavor. Also, the timing, where'd my timing parameter go? The timing is different. If you eat something and get sick instantly, nothing happens. You don't learn anything because this little box knows it takes a while to get sick. I think your story was ate the cupcake, went home, got the flu. Hours later, she's losing it. And this little chunk of brain is working back in time. It's got its own time window. It's working back in time saying, what did we eat a few hours ago? Cupcake. Don't want to eat the cupcake. Very useful thing, right? If you're a grazing, you know, an omnivore kind of animal, very useful thing to have um, a device that says, don't eat it because you know, last time you ate it, it made you sick. Oh, the other thing... When we were doing this, tone, food, tone, food, pairing over and over again. How many cupcakes did you eat? One cupcake. And, 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 and you repeated this lots of times? No. Right? Because this is a, a, a little association mechanism designed to keep you alive. And if, you know, eat the cupcake, almost die. You know, you don't want a bunch more pairings of... Eat the cupcake. Almost died. Eat the cupcake. Oh man, that time dead. You know. So one trial learning. 
which, by the way, when Garcia discovered it, um, was thought to be impossible. But it, it's a special case of an association learning that, uh, that works in a, uh, a, single, um, a single trial. It has its pitfalls. Um, and, and in fact, it, it's, it's sort of cognitive impenetrability. The fact that it doesn't care what you know um, is a problem. So, um, uh, except for the seniors here, of course, nobody here has, uh, has ever... Um, alcohol, alcohol has not passed your lips. Um, and, um, and even the seniors have not drunk to excess. So, um, what may be news to you is that if you drink too much alcohol, you can get sick. <laughs> they knew that. Okay. Um, anyway... Drink too much alcohol, you get sick, right? The question is, what do you develop the, the aversion to? A smart system, rather like this, you know, the writing example, the smart system would say, I just drank, you know, 12 screwdrivers in a row or something like that. No more vodka for me. The problem is that alcohol has very minimal flavor to it. Um, and what happens is, you drink you know, screw orange juice plus vodka or something like that, you get violently sick, I'm not going to touch that orange juice anymore. <laughs> or, you know, pile of beers and a pile of pretzels, you're violently ill and the pretzels just look miserable to you. <laughs> yeah, so it, 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 it is a disadvantage. It's clever that this thing is, not, is, is out there to save your life. Unfortunately, um, in, in, in civilization we have figured out clever ways uh, to uh, misuse it, I'm afraid. Um, the, uh, well, since it says example two is superstitious behavior, let me say a quick word about superstitious behavior. This is the best time to see what Skinner called superstitious behavior um, because all you have to do is watch baseball. Um, if you... Um, law of effect says if something good happens, you're going to do what you were doing just beforehand. Think about baseball. Um, What's something good that can happen? You get up to the plate, you hit the ball, it goes over the fence, and, and, and you get to run around and stuff. Um, well, what were you doing just before? Well, you know, maybe you wiped off your shoes or something like that. So, next time you come up to the plate, you wipe off your shoes, don't think anything about it, Pretty soon, you're doing this all the time. Some sports writer asks you, you know, how come you wipe off the shoes every time? You know, the plate's slippery or some story like that. You've got no idea why it is, but it's probably been shaped into place by the contingencies of, of, um, of reinforcement. Um, the second best place to see this, uh, in my experience, is at uh, exams. Um, look around at exams, perhaps look at yourself at exams and say, look at those three neatly lined up pencils. Points exactly lined up there. The Coke has to be exactly to the left of the test paper and the Snickers bar has to be right there. You know, or I'm going to flunk. <laughs> um, again, if you're, a- if you're asked about it, the answer is, oh, I don't know, you know, it just you know, makes me feel comfortable or something like that. But it's, again, sort of superstitious behavior, perhaps shaped into place by this sort of um, law of effect kind of, um, uh, kind of work. Um, the schedules of reinforcement, let me, let, me, let me say a bit more about how this applies out, out, out in the real world. Sch- the schedules of reinforcement are the sorts of things that uh, we do to ourselves all the time. For example, in child rearing, is that actually the next example on the handout maybe? Yeah, it says something about parents and children. Um, So, think about, um, well, uh, suppose suppose that that, that you're a little kid, which once upon a time you were, um, and and, and you want a cookie. So you say, can I have a cookie? And your mom gives you a cookie, and that's good. The next time, you say, can I have a cookie? And it's just before dinner, so she says no. So you, what do you do? Well, maybe you extinguish the behavior immediately, and you're a perfect model child, and you end up at, you know, like MIT or something like that. But odds are that you, can I have a cookie? Please, can I have a cookie? 
pretty please can I have a cookie? Eventually, I'm like, oh, here, have a cookie. Right? All right, so what have you done? We've now moved you from an FR1 to an FR something else kind, or actually it's probably a VR schedule of some sort. So now you're going to be emitting cookie behavior at a much more rapid rate, right? Can I have a cookie? Can I have a cookie? Please, can I have a cookie? I want a cookie. I need a cookie right now. Um, eventually, eventually, you know, your parents get tired of this. They decide they're you know, going to cut you off here. But you're now up here somewhere. How's that extinction curve look? Oh, man, it goes out to about, you know, age 23 or something like that. <laughs> Plus, parents are not good at this. So what you do is, can I have a cookie? 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 I really want a cookie. And, oh, can I have a cookie? Okay, now we're on a VR 2064 kind of schedule. And everybody's going nuts. Uh, the other place you see that, well, a, a similar sort of example is sleeping through the night. The kid cries. Right? You go and comfort the kid, put the kid back down to go to sleep. Eventually you decide, this little monster needs to sleep through the night because, like, I need to sleep through the night. So, um, I'm going to not get up when he cries. He's crying. I can't sleep. He's been crying for like an hour. (laughs) Oh, maybe just this time. All right, now you've rewarded him for crying for an hour rather than for crying for a couple of seconds. Um, And and again, you end up with a similar sort of problem. uh, uh, My my eldest actually had this to an absolute art when he was little. Of course, he didn't know it again because it's all nice, unconscious and reflexive stuff. He came into the world built so that if he cried for more than a few minutes, he also threw up. Right, so, you know, it's time for him to sleep through the night. He's crying, you're saying, oh man, if he doesn't go back to sleep in a second, not only am I going to go nuts, but I'm going to have to do the laundry again. (laughs) But if I reward him for, oh man, and and, you know, so he's, I don't think they sleep through the night yet, but um, is this this encouraging yet? (laughs) Mar is getting so depressed there. Um, the, uh, the, all right, that you're not babies anymore. Um, let's let's give an ex- uh, an example of the relevance of this that might have something to do with uh, something closer to adult behavior. Um, one of the interesting realms where these schedules of reinforcement may have an unintention well, none of it has intention to it. An unfortunate negative consequence um, is, is a phenomenon known in in the uh, in, in, at least in the research on um, sexual behavior as getting to yes. Um, what is this about? Uh, typically in heterosexual relationships, um, the request, uh, verbal or otherwise, for some sort of positive reinforcement of a sexual nature comes from the guy and is delivered to the woman in some fashion. Typically... That request, verbal or otherwise, is met with a no initially. If the relationship develops over time, of course, eventually, odds are that there will be a yes. Well, what does that sound like? That's some sort of a variable um, schedule of reinforcement. Oh, why might that be the case? Um, We'll talk about this more later in the term, but there is interesting evidence that, uh, uh, that guys are not just some you know, unbridled bag of hormones, that, 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 uh, but that they actually fall in love faster than women do. Um, so, you know, well, I, 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 yeah, it's the Romeo and Juliet thing, right? You know, he, 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 he's allegedly in, in love with Rosalind. He goes and sees uh, Juliet, and, and, and two seconds later, it's, you know, oh, uh, she doth teach the torches to burn bright and all that sort of stuff. You know, woo, he's gone. Um, and, and when he walks out of the party later and, and meets his friend, the psychologist, who, who does a survey kind of thing, um, he will report he feels like he's in love. Um, and I don't know what... Uh, Ju- Juliet may be a, a different example. I mean, they all end up dead and things like that. But, um, but typically, she will uh, be slower to report that she feels like she's in love. So he's sitting there saying, you know, I'm in love. 
and, and, and I'm going to be with her forever and, and if I'm going to be with her forever there's certain things that we might be interested in and, and, and so maybe and, and she's saying I just met him five minutes ago I mean what is this about um, anyway the result is some sort of a variable ratio schedule of reinforcement and you, it, 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 in most cases this works itself out um, just fine, but suppose the relationship doesn't go particularly well. Suppose, for example, um, well, so, uh, where's my extin- extinction curve? Here's a good extinction curve. So you're up here somewhere on this variable ratio schedule of reinforcement, um, and, and let's say she decides that this is not a relationship that she's um, interested in anymore. It takes him now an extremely long time, potentially, to um, uh, get the hint and stop, uh, you know, pressing that, 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 that key in the Skinner box. Um, and it's, well, we'll talk later it, um, about the, the ambiguous nature of communications in, in, in this regard. If he's not sure whether she's saying yes or no or whatever, you can end up in, in trouble. And this is an example of sort of applied, you know, where, where these sort of rules of association learning um, suddenly become relevant in, in, in behavior that's much more complicated than whether or not you're uh, pecking a, a response key in, in a Skinner box. It's that kind of application, the, the possibility of going from these very simple behaviors to much more complicated, much richer behaviors that drove um, what was the leading uh, school of psychology in the first half of the 20th century in the U.S., which was known as behaviorism, which was the doctrine that basically said, look, classical conditioning, operant conditioning, a couple of other bits, those are the atoms of behavior. And we can build up the molecules and the rest of the organism out of those atoms. That's all we need. In the same way that, um, uh, and so I put this quote from John Watson, who's the founder of American behaviorism, on there where he says, you know, we can write a, a, a psychology, define it as the science of behavior. That was a move by itself, right? No science of behavior and mental life or no science of human mental life or something. The science of behavior, of observable behavior. Never go back on our definition. Never use terms like consciousness, mental states, mind, content, and and so on. It can be done in terms of habit formation, habit integration, which are are terms for for this sort of association learning. Um, He is basically saying that, look, if if, if, if you're, you're taking chemistry and you go to the, 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 the chemistry prof and say, you know, these elements you got here, they're nice elements, but I think I want another 16 kind of constructs to explain what's going on here. The chemistry professor is going to look at you and say, no, sorry, these are the elements. Everything can be built out of this stuff. You don't like it, you got a problem. Um, and, they, and, and the behaviorists were saying essentially the same thing about psychology. They thought that the, a very small set of atoms, in this case, these laws of association, were the, you know, the, the elementary properties. And you could build, um, build up everything out of that. Um, that carried with it a couple of interesting um, bits of, uh, uh, of ideology that will recur later in the course. One of them was the idea that you were basically an association engine. You were there to learn associations. And that um, everything that was worth knowing in psychology, um, everything that was worth studying in psychology, was something that was learnable. That it was not interesting beyond the, you know, uh, in a, in for their purposes, kind of trivial things like you came with, with eyes and not radar dishes. Um, you know, beyond that sort of thing, it was uninteresting what nature had provided to you. Psychology was what, what, what was the effect of what the environment, uh, the interaction of the environment and these atoms of, um, of learning. That everybody was essentially identical until this learning started. And what got you to MIT was the contingencies of reinforcement over the, the prior 18 years 
of your life. This resonated with a certain democratic um, current in American political thought. It, this is in, in, in America in, in sort of you know grade school civics lessons form. This was the doctrine that anybody could grow up to be president. You didn't actually have to be a Bush to uh, you know to, to 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 be to be president. Anybody could be president. What was important was. Um, how the environment um, shaped you. That's a doctrine um, in its radical, in its strongest form known as empiricism. Empiricism. Have I that look about right? Empiricism. Yeah, okay. The, the, um, uh, the opposite pole is nativism. The notion that your genetic innate endowment is determinative and that um, you're here because you were born with, uh, you know, you, you, you've got the gene for calculus in there somewhere. And, you know, some of you may have now decided you lost it somewhere, but you had it, you had it once upon a time. Um, so the, the, the notion here is that it's what's critically important what the behaviorists thought was they, they were strongly weighted towards this empiricist environmentally um, driven side of things um, in a couple of minutes why aren't we why am I using the past tense why aren't we all behaviorists now there are a number of, uh, of, of reasons um, I suppose the broadest reason is to look this the, the course a course like this is full of you know on the one hand position and on the other hand you know empiricism and nativism and I'll give you a hint for the exam the answer always turns out to be both right the, 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 the extreme positions the extreme theoretical positions in psychology never seem to quite work out um, but um, more uh, sort of less trivially um, look the association uh, the the the, the, the the basics of association learning theory are absolutely worth a lecture in this course and absolutely worth chapter four. And you'll find on the handout some you know, guide, guide for reading in, in chapter four. Um, but they're not all of psychology. Um, Watson's uh, uh, statement says, you know, we can, we can uh, build a science of behavior without ever talking about uh, you know, consciousness, for example. But, you know, that's an interesting topic. And um, if I want to know about it, I don't want to be told by the, the, the field's ideologues that it's not a legitimate uh, area of inquiry. Um, I don't want to be told that emotion, uh, that, that the, the, the feelings are, um, of the, the, the feeling aspect of emotion is not a legitimate topic of psychology. Um, and that the only thing we can do is, you know, observe how many tears are coming out or, or something like that. It proved to be an incomplete psychology. In the same way, I should say, that the, the, you know, the, the, the occupants of the nativist poll at the moment are, are the um, most dogmatic of the um, evolutionary psychologists. Evolution has wonderful explanatory power in, in psychology, but evolution is not itself a psychology. It's not a complete psychology by itself. It doesn't give you the, the, the richness of the, uh, um, of the field as a whole. Uh, another important reason we're not all behaviorists is it turned out to be um, uh, somewhere between uninteresting and wrong to argue that everything uh, that was of any interest was learnable. Uh, language we'll see later in the course is an example. Of course you learned the language that you speak, but you learned it because you had a brain that was built to learn a language. And um, that innate endowment, that language learning endowment is worth study in its own right and that wasn't something that fit into the behaviorist program. Um, so that's why you're not a, uh, that's why you're not a behaviorist now. But even if you're not a behaviorist, you still want to read chapter four.